me ask you a question. If you're in Los Angeles or New York, San Francisco, Atlanta, Houston, and someone asks you, build me a courthouse, build me a civic center, what's it going to look like in the 21st century? Well, a, a typical American would have no idea. They might say a pyramid, or it might be a modernist steel and glass square rectangle shaped figure. Or there might be a few reactionaries among us who would want to make it with a classical order, architectural order. It might look like the Pantheon or the Parthenon. Let me ask you another question. If I say, paint a horse and come back to my studio tomorrow with a horse, what's it going to look like? Well, today's world, it might have one leg. It might be a blob. It might be a horse in motion that was fuzzy, sort of a Gauganish horse. Or it might be a classical horse, something right out of uh, St. Mark's Square in Venice. If I ask you to recite a poem today, you have these poetry jams. They rarely seem to rhyme. How long is it? I don't know. If I ask you to play some music, if I say, sing the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl, what's it going to sound like? We have no idea. And what I'm getting at is that in this postmodern world, all conventions and expectations have been obliterated. That for 2,500 years in classical uh, arts, and literature were the canons of expression, the rules, the parameters, the methods in which we created poetry and architecture and art and music. And my question to us today is, is this a good or a bad thing? We can call it classical tradition, and we can call the reaction against classical tradition the modern era. And then we can call whatever we are now the postmodern era. Let's walk through a few areas, architecture, art, literature. We're in classical Greece, we're in classical Rome, we're in the Renaissance, we're in the Enlightenment. And essentially, when we want to engage in art, the painting or the sculpture will look as if our eye sees it. In other words, it'll be realistic. This ability to take a piece of stone or a canvas or a painting on clay on a pot and turn it into something the eye actually sees and can be recognized as such by other people was not mastered until about 500 BC. I'll give you one example. If you ask an Egyptian artist in 1500 BC, a product of a culture who built the pyramids, to paint a profile, something like this, they will show the eye as if it's facing you, not at a profile. It's what we call the Egyptian eye. If you ask a Greek sculpture around 600 BC to sculpt a young man, he will have, whether he's happy or sad, he will have what we call the archaic smile, a stiff smile, and his arms will be like this. We call them koros, koroi. He will be a stiff, lifeless figure. Somehow in the 5th century BC at Athens and some other Greek city-states, perhaps it was the triumphalism that followed the Persian War, perhaps it was the creation of capital, perhaps it was this, the energy of literature and philosophy. We don't know quite whether it was democratic or oligarchy, but whatever the ingredients were in the field of art, people mastered that technique. And so they could carve, sculpt, paint, draw things that look like people saw them. And that tradition of realism pretty much existed as the standard of excellence in Western art until the uh, 19th century. Didn't mean that in the Byz Byzantine period or the medieval period there wasn't representational church art, but you could make the argument that in 1000 AD or 1200 AD or 1400 AD, people had lost that ability and were trying, striving to recapture it. In other words, that someone who was an artist who was carving a statue in 1400 AD did not have the same skills that they had in 440. They had lost that ability and they were striving to regain it. If we ask somebody in 1930 or 1940 to paint or draw or to sculpt something, there is no guarantee that it would resemble exactly what the eye saw. So you have Gauguin, you have Cezanne, you have Van Gogh, you have any Impressionist artist. 
what they're going to try to do is add something other than realism, because once you get to realism or even idealism, better than the eye can see, no wrinkles, always young, sort of the excellent the apogee of Greek art, you can't go any further. So you have a modernist rebellion against it. Now, what caused modernism? Why didn't we have a modernist period in the Roman period? Once people could master Greek art, why didn't the Romans have disfigured art? Or why didn't the Romans paint things like Van Gogh's sunflowers or Starry Night? I don't know the answer, but there was not a reaction against classicism until the 20th century or the late 19th century. Perhaps it was the era of revolution in Europe in 1848. Perhaps it was the Industrial Revolution, the presence of great wealth great disparities in wealth. No doubt World War I had a contributing factor where suddenly the three million of European youth were slaughtered for senselessness, supposedly in the trenches of Europe. Whatever the result was is that art became representational. It was still recognizable as realistic, it was, but we called it modern rather than classical art. And as the 20th century played out, it grew more and more representational, more and more symbolic, more and more unrealistic, if I should say that. So if Pablo Picasso wants to paint a bull or Salvador Dali wants to paint a clock, it's not going to look like the clock you see or it's not going to look like the bull you see. It's going to be a bull that's in the mind of Picasso. It might be in your mind too, but it's not going to be what the eye sees. That's what we call modernism in art. But what do you go, where do you go beyond modernism? If you've rejected classical canons of realism and idealism, and you've tried to add something to the artistic experience, motion maybe, or tragedy, or color, that the eye can't quite um, see in the actual art or the actual object. After you've done that, how do you react against modernism? The act is, and the answer is you destroy all canons, all parameters of artistic expression. So I'm in a studio now, I can take a cup of coffee and pour it on the ground and say, that's art. I can urinate in a jar, that's art. I rebel against the very nature of any canons whatsoever. I'm not a modernist, I'm a something after modernism, a postmodernist. That's pretty much the, st the status of art, getting back to the initial question. If I asked you to draw a horse, nobody today has any idea what it's going to look like. The same holds true in architecture. If we go back to the initial question, what is our courthouse going to look like? We don't know. But, and this is very important, we would know until about 1850. It would be a classical building, and by that I mean it would have probably be in rectangular shape. It would have a pyramidal roof. It would have a pediment, a cornice, roof tiles. It would have one of the classical ionic orders or Doric orders or Corinthian orders. In other words, the columns would either be sort of squat and they would be without a base and they would have fluting and they would have an abacus at the top with triglyphs and metopes and an outdoor freeze course. Let's go to Washington, D.C. and that's essentially the buildings in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Berlin, London. All public buildings followed the classical mode. Or they would be the Ionic order. They would not have Flutes, they would have fillets. They would have a scroll instead of an abacus. They would have a base. They wouldn't have triglyphs and metaphys. They would just have a continual freeze course. Or they could be Corinthian. Instead of having an abacus or a scroll as a capital, they might have a canthus lead. But the point is that the viewer of this public building would have expectations that it would have to be classical in some sense. It might have a dome in the matter of Santa Sophia or the Pantheon. It might have uh, an egg and dart or a bead and reel ornamentation, but there would be expectations that it had to be within these identifiable parameters. And what's the purpose of this? It reflects two things. One, that people have reached the limits of excellence. In other words, when you see a Parthenon or you see a Pantheon, there's not much more you can do with a building as far as symmetry and angles and beauty and utility to match that standard of excellence. That's one thing it does. And the other thing it does for the viewer and the civic participant and the person who goes in and out of the building is it says that this is something you expect for in a public building. It's a way of familiarizing the citizenry. It's not something that confuses them. It puts them at ease. It makes them relax. That's the purpose of classical architecture. 
What is modern architecture? It's obviously, just in the case of painting, it's a reaction against that genre. So in the 1920s, 1930s, again, the same criteria, whether it's political upheaval in the 19th century, or the Industrial Revolution, or the tragedies and horrors of World War I, whatever the particular reason, people say, we don't accept your system. Maybe the architect, like the artist, is saying, we do not accept capitalism. We don't accept democracy. We don't accept the modern industrial world because your modern world gave us the Somme or gave us Verdun. Whatever the particular reason is, you don't use classical architectural orders, classical shapes. So we have square buildings. We have something called functionalism. It says, if it's not needed, don't put it on. If you have a classical chair and it's got a bead and reel design on it or it's got a lion foot base on the uh, legs of the chair or if it's engraved or it's got a classical look to it, the modernist comes and says, oh my gosh, what do all those carvings do? They don't make me sit any more comfortably. I believe functionalism is the answer. Only what is absolutely necessary is absolutely beautiful. So we started to see, instead of the classical orders in public buildings, we saw throughout Europe, the United States, square building with glass and aluminum, functional. And this was considered a reaction toward classicism, the unnecessary gaudiness, the unnecessary uh, and confining nature of an architectural order. How do you go beyond that? Once again, what do you do if you're a postmodernist? What do you do? Do you say, I want to be all glass, I want to be all metal. No, you say, I reject the reaction against classicism. You're still using lines, you're still using squares, you're still using rectangles, you're still using windows. If I want to put a postmodern building at the Louvre, I'll make a pyramid, how do you like that? Or I'll make a geodesic dome. Or I'll make something like the Australian Opera Center in Sydney. I don't, I'm not confined by right angles. I'm not a Greek, I'm not a Roman, I'm not a reactor toward a Greek and a Roman. I don't believe in square corners. And so now today we have something called postmodern architecture. Houses don't have to look like a classical Victorian anymore. They don't have to look like a Frank Lloyd Wright reaction against a classical Victorian. They can be domes, they can be squares, they can be underground, they can be anything. So we're told. And this, again, is supposed to be an improvement on the classical reactionary way of art architectural and artistic expression. Now we are finally freed of this legacy, this burden, to build and paint and experience art and architecture in a way that is completely free. The same old truth we go to literature. The Greeks had this very strange idea that they wanted to define and limit the areas of literary expression, and only literary expression. By that I mean there's going to be epic, and lyric, and tragedy, and comedy, and history, and oratory, and philosophical expression, and maybe satire, and maybe fiction, and none other. And each of these areas is going to be clearly defined and have rules of participation. If you don't want to participate, you're not a poet, you're not a historian, you're not a philosopher. And we're going to do this in the manner we did of art and architecture because we want the reader to be familiar and we want to have the artist work within canons and parameters because we think it's harder, not easier, and it creates greater than less beauty. So let's go through some of these genres. They're sort of like the Ionic or the Doric or the Corinthian architectural orders or the notion in art that you're painting on pots or you're painting on frieze courses or you're sculpting. Epic poem. Epic poem has certain rules. It's got to be about 10,000 lines long to 15,000 lines. The Iliad, the Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, Apollonius of Rhodes, Argonautica. And because it was originally delivered in an oral fashion through oral poetry, through memorization, even when the written word came along and it wasn't, there still shall be repetition. Rosy finger, dawn, rosy finger, dawn, rosy finger, dawn. Hector was killed and his armor fell upon him. Even though Virgil's writing it out, he will say Turnus is killed and his armor fell upon him. So you have repetition of language. You have a particular link. It has to be in a dactylic hexameter verse. Da, ta, da, 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 da. If you're a modernist, you say, I want to write an epic, but I don't want to use hexameter. I want to use iambic pentameter. Sorry, it's not an epic. It's got to be about a great theme. What's the great theme of Eric? epics? War, taking Troy. The founding of Rome, Odysseus trying to get home against the Cyclops and Circe and Charybdis and Scylla, etc. It's got to be an adventure 
uh, some type of war, some type of strife, some type of violence, some great love. It has to be a, a, a very important topic, so to speak, or you're not an epic poet. Some people don't want to read epics. Some people can't write epics. So if they're still a poet, they can do something else. They have to be a lyric poet. And what does lyricism says? Well, you can write a poem, but it has to have a particular vocabulary, an elevated vocabulary, a vocabulary you don't use in everyday speech. There's no equivalent of a Latin or Greek F word. People wouldn't use that in a poem as they do today. And the meter cannot be hexameter. It might be elegiacs. It might be pentameters. It might be trimeters. It might be troches. It might be glyconics. It might be sapphics. It'll be a different meter, a lighter meter. And the topic won't be heavy and monumental and warlike. It might be Sappho writing about the moon. It might be Archilochus talking about old age. It might be love poetry. It's light. That's called lyric poetry, originally developed with the lyre, in accompaniment with the lyre. So we have a second canon of poetry. You basically have a choice. You can be an epic poem, epic poet, or you can be a lyric poet, period. Let's say you're not a poet. Let's say you don't like poetry. You like to go to the theater. So you're going to go to the theater, and you're going to have two choices. It can either be tragic or it can be comic. If it's tragic, there's going to be rules. Two, three, and finally, perhaps four actors, no more. About 1,000 to 1,500 lines. Can you have a 2,500 line tragedy? No. The longest, I think, is Oedipus at Colonus at 1,700. Agamemnon of Aeschylus is about 1,600. And it will have to be an iambic pentameter with occasional strange metrics in the chorus. And it will have to be about a mythological topic. You may have had the Battle of Salamis and Aeschylus of Persian, but all the other classical plays are mythological. And that's it. If you want to write about Antigone, you better have her on the stage for about an hour, 1,400 lines with two other characters. And for the first half of the tragedy is usually you see one side of the actor's point of view, and the second half you see the others. If it's Euripides' Pentheus, Pentheus is a arrogant, stupid young kid who unnecessarily provokes Dionysus and will get killed. In the second half, Dionysus is, should have acted better. He's a god. He was too mean to Pentheus in his revenge. Antigone is an idealistic feminist heroine. In the second part, she's kind of stubborn, and she won't give in. Same thing with Prometheus. Same thing with Oedipus. That's the canons of tragedy. The people fill into the theater of Dionysus at Athens. They know what to expect. Let's say you don't like tragedy, you don't like epic, you don't like lyric. You like light things. You like comedy. Well, you have two or three choices. You can have old comedy, middle comedy, or new comedy, but they're pretty much the same. They have a meter. They last about 1,500 lines. If it's old comedy, it's about politics, sort of like Saturday Night Live. You make fun of people that everybody knows. If you don't like old comedy, you go into middle comedy and it's sitcom, sort of like Seinfeld, mistaken identity, psychodramas, middle and new comedy. That's it. Let's say you don't like any of these genres, you want to read history. What's history? You want to read a history of the Ionic order? No, it's not there. Do you want to read a history of the Scythian people? No, it's not there. If you want to read history, it's going to be about eight books long, each book somewhere around in today's page, pagination, about 30 or 40 pages. If you're going to read the first historian, Herodotus, it's going to be about the Persian War. If you're going to read the second great historian, Thucydides, it's going to be the Peloponnesian War. If you're going to read the third great historian, Xenophon, it's the Hellenic Wars. If you want to read about Polybius, it's the Punic Wars. If you want to read Livy, the Punic Wars. War is considered suitable for history, not much else. What is history then in the classical tradition? It's writing about something that's more important than something else. And, and the way the classical mind works, War compresses time and space. People risk everything. They do strange things. They do wonderful things. They do horrible things within the compass of war. That's a canon. And you'll have characters speak. They'll, they'll, they'll give speeches. There won't be footnotes, of course. You can put ideas into the mouths of characters, whether you actually heard them or not. You can improvise. But that's the canon of history. If you're a philosophical thinker, you can either write a treatise in prose, or you can have a dialogue. And Pl Plato popularized the dialogue in most philosophers after Plato, especially Cicero, tried to emulate the idea you have two characters and they talk back and forth, sometimes three, and they present a philosophical thesis and then they try to support it or reject it. 
or you can be Aristotle, mostly lecture notes rather than a polished work of literature, and you can have a formal treatise, nothing much else. The Romans added two new genres to literary expression. The satire, usually written in dactylic hexameter, da, 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 a beat, six times, and they make fun of people. Petronius's Tyricon is a novel, juvenile satire is a poem, but you're making fun of the absurdities of Roman life. The Greeks never really thought that was a serious genre, they didn't pursue it. Or you can have a novel. A novel is a Roman product. The Greeks start to use it in the Hellenistic period a little bit, but you can have the idea of making a story and having a narrator and characters. That's literary expression, that's classical expression, it's just like art, architecture. That's pretty much the story of Western expression in the arts for 2,500 years. And then what happens? We go back to the same sequence of events that so altered architecture and art, and I could go into music, almost every expression, every facet of human expression. I don't know if it was the political upheaval of the 19th century, again and again and again, World War I, whatever the particular catalysts were, this system of literary genres was destroyed as a system of architectural orders was destroyed as a system of realistic and idealistic painting and artistic expression was destroyed. And the people who originally destroyed it were masters at it, just like the modern architects and the modern painters could, if they had to, be a classical artist or a classical architect. Frank Lloyd Wright knew what the Ionic order was. Cezanne could paint as if he was a Renaissance painter if he wanted to. T.S. Eliot could have written like Homer or Sappho had he wanted to, so perhaps even Ezra Pound or Wallace Stevens. But under the new expression, a poem would have an elevated vocabulary perhaps, but it didn't have to be confined to an epic or lyric topic. There would be no meter. It didn't have to rhyme if it did not want to. It could be of any length, but it was identifiable as a poem. It was a reaction against classical constraints, but it was still identifiable as a poem. Modern comedy might not be an hour and a half. It might be four hours. It might be 30 minutes, but there was certain uh, shadows, fumes of classical comedy. Same thing with tragedy, same thing with novels. You pick up Steinbeck or Hemingway, it's not that different than Xenophon of Ephesus or Petronius. There's a central character, it's antagonist, protagonist, it's about three or 400 pages long, etc. But it is a reaction uh, against the confining limits of classical uh, novelistic expression. We could do this with history, we could do this with philosophical speculation. Where do you go after you've reacted against classical methods of expression and you're in the modern period? There's only one other avenue and that's what we call postmodernism. So you're reacting against the modern reaction against classicism. So today's poem says, I reject classicalism. I don't, classicism, I don't even know how to express it myself. I don't know what meter is. I don't know what rhyme is. I couldn't rhyme if I had to. I don't know what epic is. I don't care. I'm going to write a poem and arbitrarily break the lines wherever I want. I can use all sorts of terms for excrement, fornicate, anything I want, I just throw it in there. Or the novelist can say, I'm going to have write an anti-novel. I'm going to have, I'm just going to start in the beginning of everything and end, and you never know who's who and what's what. That's what I choose to do. Or I'm going to write a history and I'm going to tell you that it might be true and it might not be true. I'm going to try to play tricks on you. Historians do that. So I'm going to imagine things, and who are you to say? that it's true or not. I reject your whole arbitrary standards based as they are on the power and privilege of a particular caste to adjudicate what's true and not true. Where does all this leave us? Well, in the 21st century, we're living in a world in which there are no rules or canons of expression in art, of architecture, of literature, of music, of any expression of the the human psyche, and we're told that this was a liberating experience because we were allowed, allowing people to participate in the artistic endeavor who didn't know the classical canons of meter, they didn't know how to rhyme, they didn't have to memorize what an ionic order is, they didn't have to go to art school and learn perspective or that the head should be one-eighth the size of the body. They didn't have to do any of those constructs as they called them. They were all the product of a privileged society that arbitrarily made rules of participation. And we, as radical egalitarians, and let's be candid, Neil has said anybody can participate. And the result is that when we look at a painting today, or we look at 
a civic monument today or building, or we pick up a piece of literature, we have no idea what to expect. And the final irony is, amid that chaos and unhappiness and confusion, we call that progress. I'll leave it to you to determine whether it's progress or regression.